Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to this edition of the Wild Neighbors Speaker Series. Um, I'm Johanna Arendt with Travis County, and we're happy to have Jonah Evans, our state mammologist with Texas Parks and Wildlife with us today to talk about animal tracks and signs. Um, this webinar series is hosted by Travis County and City of Austin, which manage the majority of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, which is a, a 50 square mile preserve that protects endangered species in West Austin and Western Travis County. And I'm going to change slides here if I can. Hmm, it's not letting me, there we go. And here are some links about the BCP so you can learn more about it and how to get involved and uh, come out and enjoy the preserve this year with us. Um, during the presentation, uh, if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A box down at the bottom, not the chat. Um, and at the end, uh, my colleague Jeremy Hull will be reading your questions to Jonah after the presentation. Um, so with that, take it away, Jonah. All right, thank you. Um, let's start my video here and share my screen. So first of all, thank you, Johanna and Travis County and um, all of you for organizing this uh, and inviting me to share one of my passions with you all, which is animal tracks and sign. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, Johanna said, I'm the mammologist for Parks and Wildlife, but what does that mean? Um, when I got the title, I was pretty excited about it and then quickly realized that I you know, got a lot of blank stares when I explained it to people. So, so within Parks and Wildlife, I'm in charge of all of the uh, non-game, rare threatened mammal research, conservation, and um, you know other, other efforts that we do. And so if it's a coyote, if it's a bat, if it's a mountain lion, um, if it's a ocelot, that would fall in my shop. Things that don't fall in my shop would be things like deer and uh, bighorn sheep and other game animals. Even, even tree squirrels are considered game animals. So those are not in my shop. Um, I've also been uh, gosh, you know, borderline obsessed, I guess, would be fair to say, uh, with animal tracks for a long time, since I was about 18 years old, and that was, that's starting to seem like a really, really long time ago now, um, but since I was, uh, 18 years old, I have been fascinated by animal tracks and sign, and I've traveled around the country and studied with every different expert and field guide author I could find, and, um, and hopefully I'll, you know, I'll be able to share some of my uh, passion and sort of reason that I'm obsessed with animal tracks with you here. So when most people go for a walk out in the woods, they find nature to be this really beautiful, serene place with, you know, stunning landscapes and beautiful scenery, but oftentimes largely devoid of animal life. You know, people might see a couple deer off in the distance, they might hear a squirrel in a tree, but then you look at a field guide and you see things like badgers and you see things like, um, you know, ringtails and and other, other animals that are supposed to be in your area, uh, weasels. I mean, all kinds of different things are supposed to be in your area, but you never see them. Um, however, if you start looking for animal tracks and sign, you'll notice that there are signs of life absolutely everywhere. And so in the upper left here is a sparrow and what's called like a typical feeding behavior, taking small little steps. Uh, in the upper right is a uh, acorn woodpecker larder where they store uh, acorns. And, and I guess that's not really much of a Texas sign, but it's something that's pretty cool to find. Lower left is uh, porcupine chews and lower right is spotted skunk tracks. And here's just a few more. Um, we have coyote tracks. Can you, uh, Johanna or someone, can you confirm that you can see my mouse right now or, or not? Yes, can yes we can. Great, perfect, thanks. Um, so up in, up in this corner, these are coyote tracks where it stopped. It did what's called a box stop or stopped and looked to the left before continuing on. Uh, this is moose uh, feeding sign on Aspen, a bobcat scat. You can see the tracks where it stopped right here. And then up here we have a raccoon, a Eastern chipmunk, a jumping mouse and a paramiscus, which is a small mouse. 
So I kind of already alluded to this, but why learn to track? Uh, lots of animals are camouflaged, nocturnal, and shy, and tracks just aren't. Um, although I will, uh, I, I'd like to clarify briefly what I mean by tracks. Uh, a lot of people, when they think of tracks, they think of uh, footprints. And these are these are beautiful footprints of a caiman from South America, but these are just um, these are this is one of the types of sign that I consider sort of in this under this umbrella. We also look for scats, like this coyote scat here. Uh, urine. Uh, this is a very common sign in West Texas. This is a urine bleached mark on the ground from a cottontail. Jackrabbits do that as well. Feeding signs, this is one that we're all unfortunately too familiar with. This is feral hog rooting. Cough pellets, most people are aware that owls make cough pellets. And you've probably, if you're fortunate, you probably had the experience of getting to dissect an owl pellet in one of your uh, classes as a kid. Well, did you know that lots and lots of other birds make pellets as well? Everything from hawks and ravens and crows and jays to shorebirds. These are sanderling pellets uh, from the coast in California. Uh, trails and runs, shelters, dens, burrows, and nests, uh, and skulls and bones. So that's typically, you know, the, the kinds of things we're thinking about. Any and every sign that an animal could leave, leave behind is an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to uh, discover something cool about these animals. So I imagine we have a couple folks uh, who are interested in bird identification. And just like when you learn birds, there's field marks that you look for with, um, with tracking. And there's sort of a process that I recommend people go through when they begin uh, exploring tracking. Uh, one common analogy that is used is to think of it as learning your ABCs. Well, you start with identifying clear footprints in clear substrate. So here's a clear dog track, here's a clear uh, raccoon print, here's a clear possum track. Learn some nice clear footprints and just learn to identify them. And that's much like learning your ABCs. You can look at this chart here and say, oh, that's the letter A and that's the letter B. They're all capital letters and perfectly clear. Over time and with, a, with practice, you begin to hone your ability to read more and more complex uh, language, uh, so to speak. And so in this graffiti rendition of the alphabet, you can see that your brain can still recognize these letters, even though they are a far cry from what we were initially taught they look like. And that's a key tool in tracking because there's so much variation to look for. And so when it comes to field marks, here's some of the things that I recommend we look for. Number one, uh, the number and shape of toes. And so here you can see that we have five toes. Uh, they are round little pads. They are not long fingers. The next, what is, uh, you know, are, are claws present? And what is the shape of the claws? Are they very long? Are they very short? Are they blunt or are they uh, sharp? And in this case, we have five claws um, and they're all pretty long. And then is the track symmetrical or asymmetrical? So if I draw a line through the middle of the track, I, I actually like to draw a line through the middle of the heel pad or the palm pad as best I can. And don't, you know, imagine hiding the toes and just trying to split that palm pad in half. If the toes line up evenly, then it's more or less symmetrical. In this case, it's slightly asymmetrical. Then the palm pad shape, is it made up of separate small pads? Is it one big flat pad? And then finally, is there a heel pad? And I said finally, but I lied. Finally, the size of the track. And here it's important just to look at the field guide that you're using and confirm how they measure tracks. There's no consistency across guides here. Some will include claws, some will include those posterior heel pads, and others will only include the uh, toes and the palm pad. And that's sort of my preference because you'll find tracks without claws sometimes and without those posterior pads showing. And if you have the base part of the track then you can still get a useful measurement off of it. So just uh, a, you know, to review, 
we have claws, toe pads, palm pads, and heel pads. And I'm not using really scientific uh, jargon here, but there are more correct uh, terminology if you prefer that listed in the image there. So in the rest of this presentation, one of the things I'm gonna work on with you all is building up what we call search images. And a search image is essentially your ability to have an image in your mind so that when you're looking for something, you're looking for something that, that fits that image. So um, you'll probably be familiar with this. Somebody drops something in the ground and you know a lens cap or something and you're like oh no we're never going to find it what's it look like and someone else gets another lens cap and throws it on the ground so you can get that image in your brain same idea so here we have a fragment of a track in gray and if we have these different search images in your mind of other tracks you can then imagine trying to fit different tracks in there to see which one it could be and another example of that is this so here we have some squiggly lines on the page. And what I want you to do is look at it and in your mind, try to imagine what you think it could be. And I'll add a few more lines here. And what I, I'm curious if anybody's got it yet. I, I guess you probably can't unmute, but if anybody can throw in the chat or in the Q&A what you think it is, let me know. Um, We've got a couple of get guesses that is the state of Texas. Perfect, all right. so. Amazing, right? So with our brain's pattern recognition abilities, you're able to look at a few squiggly lines on a map or on a piece of paper and immediately recognize that it's the state of Texas. And that's because that image is burned into your brain. Let's do one more and feel free to chime in as soon as you have an idea of what it is. I'll add a few more lines here. Johanna, any... Um, Anybody yet? So that's Kyrgyzstan. Um, and I imagine nobody guessed it. But if you are from that country, clearly you would see that image and immediately know, oh, that's my native country. And so I just show this to you to make the point that when you're looking for tracks and sign, if you don't have these search images burned into your brain already, you're not, you're not gonna have any idea what you're looking at. And so the rest of this presentation, I'm going to try to burn some search images into your brain. Um, and it's gonna start with this. There's a couple uh, track ID shortcuts that I like to use. Uh, the basic idea is if you just count the number of toes, you can group tracks into some broad categories. So if you're looking at the tracks and all you're seeing is four toes on both front foot and hind foot tracks, and if you can't tell which is which, it doesn't matter because you're only finding tracks with four toes, then you're looking at dogs, cats, and rabbits. If you're looking at tracks and you're finding five toes on all the tracks, the fronts and the hinds are showing five toes, then you're looking at raccoons, weasels, skunks, shrews, if you're in West Texas, maybe bears. And now if you're finding tracks with four toes on the front and five toes on the back, so some of those tracks show four and some show five and they're long little fingers, uh, then you're looking at rodents. And so that'd be things like squirrels, mice, and, and um, other rodents, beavers, nutria, porcupines. And then finally, if you're seeing two toes or one toe, I mean, if it's two toes, then you're looking at deer, hogs, sheep, cows. If you're looking at one toe, then it's either a horse, a zebra, or a, um, a donkey, or a mule. Um, I said zebra, but we are living in Texas, so you never know. Um, all right, so we're gonna dive a little bit deeper here into the four toed critters. And here, I'm just, we don't have time to talk about everything, but I'm gonna go into the number one question that I get about animal tracks, and that is, well, am I looking at a mountain lion track? Is this a photo of a mountain lion track or a dog track? So I'm gonna to try to uh, give you some tools here that will help you with this. And I will just quickly say that there are always tracks that break these rules. There are always tracks out there that will be confusing. And so don't be surprised if you get out there and start looking at tracks and find a confusing one. But by and large, and in general, when you find dog tracks, you'll see four toes. The claws usually show, but not always. And I've seen plenty of, of large tracks without claws showing. 
uh, from dogs. And I've had people tell me things like, oh, I just knew it was a mountain lion because the track was so big and there was no claws. Well, dogs can be larger than mountain lions and they can easily leave tracks with no claws. So that's not really a very good um, clue to rely on. Uh, next is, is the track symmetrical? And dog tracks tend to be symmetrical. And then next, uh, can you draw an X through the negative space? And so here you can see that if I draw an X through in between the toes, right, I can draw a nice little X there. And then the palm pad is triangular in shape. So again, is the track symmetrical? Here's a different dog track. Uh, you know, it's more or less symmetrical. I, I you try to draw an X through this one. It's a real big dog. It doesn't quite work perfectly. That's all right. These rules are flexible. Uh, and the palm pad is triangular in shape. Now, to me, this is probably one of the most valuable clues. If you remember anything related to mountain lion versus dog track is this. If you imagine all the toes and you imagine trying to move them down into the pad, you can usually only fit about three in a dog track. And if you try to fit that fourth toe, it just won't fit in there. And the, in, a, in a mountain lion, you can usually fit all four toes. So that's just another way of saying that a mountain lion's uh, palm pad is larger in proportion to the whole overall track than a domestic dog. So in a domestic dog, the palm pad takes up a smaller proportion of the total track. Moving on to cat tracks. So again, they have four toes and the claws rarely show on cats. Uh, they tend to be asymmetrical. And if you try to draw an X through the track, it doesn't really work at all. And this negative space between the toes is more of like a C shape, it's a curved shape there. Another thing you'll see is that there's a double lobe at the top of the pad right there. And then you know, the palm pad is proportionally larger. And so on this track, if I, uh, if I tried to imagine the toes, and actually just briefly, I'll, I got ahead of myself, uh, that double lobe at the top of the track, some people, are, I'm sorry, at the top of the heel pad, some people think of that as being like a wide flat portion of the pad, making this palm pad a trapezoidal shape. So you can see how it's more of a trapezoid than a triangle, if that makes sense. And then lastly, if we imagine filling in those toes and moving them into the pad, in this case, we can easily fit all four toes. So here's a couple other mountain lion tracks. Uh, the front and hind feet are slightly different with the front track down below uh, here being a little uh, more asymmetrical and the hind track being a little bit more symmetrical. But by and large, they all show those same characteristics. There's a few more mountain lion tracks. They tend to walk with the front track landing and then the hind track landing beyond it. So you get that uh, front hind, front hind kind of ongoing pattern there. And this is the track of a bobcat. Same exact deal, double lobe at the top, asymmetrical with a clear leading toe. Incidentally, a cool little thing I'll show you. Let's look back at this one. We'll, we'll look at the lower track here. The thumb on a mountain lion's front foot is higher up on the leg. So that's called toe one. It doesn't show in the track. So if you imagine lifting your hands up and hide your thumb, and try to guess which hand this would be if it was your hand. Is this a left or a right? So mountain lions have a leading toe and it's always the same toe. Just like on your hands, you have a leading toe. That'd be your middle finger, right? So your, your middle finger is always the longest on a person. And on this uh, mountain lion track, it's the same toe. So their thumb is missing. The thumb would be down here, meaning that this is a left foot. It's kind of a cool little thing you can use to tell uh, which side of body a track is um, in, in pretty much every feline. So in this bobcat track right here, you can tell that there is a leading toe on this front track, right? And, um, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to know if people are getting it or not without being able to hear you, um, you know, through the, through the internet here. But uh, basically, if I held my hand up and hid my thumbs and tried to see which uh, finger arrangement lined up the best with the toe arrangement, it would be my right hand. So moving on to animals with five toes. We have bears, raccoons, weasels, skunks, and the teeny tiny shrews. Um, and uh, just uh, due to the time allotment for this presentation, I had to take out some of the pictures here. If we have time to 
Q and A, we can show some of the details of these species. Um, if there's anything I want to say, I guess what I would just say about this one is raccoons are everywhere. They are tricksters. They their tracks can look like a lot of other things. When people are just getting into tracking, they'll frequently be fooled by raccoon tracks that only show four toes and look a lot like bobcats. Um, so something to be aware of there. Oh, and actually I did show up. That was weird. They lost my hit four to skip the slide. Um, so yeah, here's some photos of some raccoon tracks look like nice little kid hands and raccoon walking in the mud here uh, the hind feet tend to register deeper and have this long heel that shows up front foot the toes and display out more and register not as deeply and this is one other animal that we have in texas it's in the raccoon family it's very small it's in central texas all around austin but only comes out in the darkest, darkest time of night. This is a ringtail. And their, uh, their tracks look a lot like a house cat. That, and one thing I'll point out is the hind foot here is landing on top of the front track. And that happens with lots and lots of animals. So it's very common for hind foot prints to land on top of front tracks. So when you're first getting into tracking and you're trying to identify a track, be aware that that is something that could happen to be careful when you see tracks like this where it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven toes, right? If you count seven toes, there's probably something wrong going on and you might try to uh, look at it from a different angle. Uh, weasels, we really don't have very many in Texas uh, and their tracks can be a little bit confusing to identify. So I'm gonna skip that one for now uh, for the long tail weasel, but but uh, we have a lot of other animals in the weasel family, so badgers and river otters, which this is of. Um, and river otters have been uh, becoming more and more common in the Austin area and in Travis County. Uh, here's a close up of some of them. This is a front track here and a hind track here. And if you look really closely between these toes, you can see a little bit of webbing showing up. Here's some here between these toes, there's some webbing, and between these two, there's some webbing as well. Uh, river otters very frequently move in this sort of lope pattern, it's called, where it's a, you know, a little bounding lope gait where the two front tracks land and then the two hind tracks in a little group like this. And this is another weasel. Uh, this is the badger. Badgers have huge claws, very blunt, heavy claws, and their feet are designed for digging. Uh, and these tracks are about, you know, an inch and a half or two inches long, um, well, you know, small dog size. And then uh, striped skunks, five toes on the front, five in the hind, uh, also have big claws, good for digging, very flat pads, much smaller. And again, if this is the point in the presentation, I think where people start to, their brain starts to swim a little bit. I'm not expecting anyone to remember all of it. It is being recorded, so you can come back later and look at some of these pictures if you're curious. Uh, but the, um, th this is the point where I just wanna reiterate uh, and my goal here is to show people a lot of tracks with a brief little uh, introduction to them so that you begin to form those search images in your brain. So next time you're out on a walk and you see some tracks on the ground, you think, oh, didn't he say? And you'll remember it just enough to go get the field guide and look it up. Um, okay, so next we're moving on to rodents. Uh, four toes in the front, five in the back. Um, and there are a lot and lot, a lot of rodents, uh, but they all have a very similar foot structure. Uh, you know, these, these, are, these are fronts on the lefts and rights on the hinds. So it's a little front track and a hind track, front and a hind, front and hind. They're all um, different rodents, but similar in, in their structure. Um, rodents can be itsy bitsy like these pocket mouse tracks. Uh, right here, we have a front track another front track and then two hind tracks. And they, they are, you know, they're very common rodent tracks like these uh, tree squirrel tracks. This is like a Western gray squirrel, but they look identical to any of the tree squirrels we have, like an Eastern or a fox squirrel. Uh, uh, hind tracks up above, front tracks down below with the two posterior pads right down there. This is one of my favorite rodent tracks to find. Really, really weird. They almost never leave toe marks. They have these very strange pads that leave this weird pebbly texture that looks a lot like 
a basketball pad or something. And then way beyond that pad where there's that pebbly texture, you'll see some claw marks. So this is the hind foot here, the claw marks up there. And here's the front foot right here, the claw marks. This is the track of a porcupine. And they, um, they're they just very strange, unusual uh, tracks, really fun to find just because of how unusual they are. Oftentimes the species will leave uh, big drag marks from their tail and the quills. And I'll, and I'll just be walking along a trail and see this sort of wavy uh, drag mark from porcupines, really cool. And then this one uh, is about eight inches long and very strange looking. Uh, people often think it's a dinosaur or a bird of some kind, but this is actually a rodent. This is a beaver. So here is the hind foot from here to here. And this is the outermost toes. So that's the pinky toe and ring finger and middle finger. And then the pointer finger and the thumb often don't register. Sometimes they do, but in this case they did not. And it stepped on its front track right there. So lastly, we have animals with two toes, and that would be things like deer, feral hogs, sheep, and peccary, and cows, and things like that. And for this presentation, I really just want to talk about feral hog tracks uh, and how to tell them from deer. So feral hogs have very, uh, first of all, two toes in the front, and then they have these two dew claws that show up in the back. And the dew claws are very widely spaced. And also the tips of the toes are very rounded and blunt. So if you imagine this track, you can actually imagine moving it between the dew claws and fitting between them without touching them. Whereas in deer, those dew claws would be directly behind the track. And they, and they show less frequently in deer tracks as well. There's a couple other things that we could talk about if we have questions about feral hog tracks, but that's a really good thing to look for is how wide those dew claws are. Also how blunt the toes are. So this is a frail hog on the left, round, rounded tips, splayed a little bit at the front. And then here's a deer on the right, pointed tips. So I know I'm the, mam the mammologist and I know this is mostly about mammals, but I can't have a tracking presentation without at least mentioning uh, some other taxonomic groups. So bird tracks can be really fun to get into and surprisingly you can identify a lot of birds from footprints. And if you ever get the field guide to bird tracks and sign by Mark Elbrock, you'll notice that it's categorized into five sections based on the type of track. And just bird feet are so much simpler than mammal feet, it's very easy to do that. So the bird tracks are thing, uh, categorized into uh, classic tracks, they call them, with three toes in the front and one in the back. And that would basically be every type of perching bird out there, uh, herons, egrets, um, hawks, uh, you know, doves, robins, sparrows, three toes in the front, one in the back. Then you have game bird tracks, and we call this the game bird category. There are there are birds that are categorized as game bird for hunting that are that don't have this foot structure like doves. Um, but basically birds that spend a lot of time on the ground, turkeys, grouse, quail, uh, killdeer, a lot of shorebirds have this structure, three toes in the, in the front and no toe in the back, sometimes a tiny dot showing up. And then you have zygodactyl, two in the front and two in the back. And that'd be things like owls, those are screech owl tracks, uh, roadrunners, uh, woodpeckers, and then palmate, which would be things like ducks and geese. And then totopalmate, which would basically be cormorants and um, pelicans. So what's cool is with that book, you just figure out which category it is, and they're all organized by size. So you just zoom to the right, you know, length of your track and flip to those pages, and you can identify the tracks really quickly. It's a pretty, pretty fun thing to do. There's also a whole world of herp tracks out there, things like these um, turtle tracks, uh, alligators, frogs toads, lizards, um, snakes. Um, and last but not least, invertebrate tracks. Uh, and you know we can find and actually identify a lot of different invertebrates, such as this uh, darkling beetle, scorpion trails, spiders, caterpillars, worms, 
mud dauber digs. I find these in every little mud puddle all over the place at the right time of year. And crayfish tracks. And so these are just a few examples of the types of invertebrate tracks that um, we look for. So, okay, so that might have seemed like a whole lot of information. If this is your first foray into animal tracks, a couple of notes I want to make is that learning a new language takes some time. And that's essentially what you're trying to do. Um, and today we just began to learn a few letters. What's really fun and where animal tracking starts to really become addictive is when you start to learn how to read words and put those words together into sentences and then begin reading larger stories. And what I mean by that is first you're identifying the track, then you're identifying the gait pattern. How did the animal move? Then you're identifying um, you know, what it was doing. Why was it there? Was it being, was it hunting? Was it being hunted? Was it chasing something? Was it avoiding something? You know, you get to read all kinds of stories into the landscape and that's where it starts to really take off. And, you know, one thing I like to say is that tracking opens up a world or a window into a different world rather. Um, nature goes from being this place of serene landscapes to this place of, of intense natural wildlife dramas that are taking taking place like a National Geographic movie on a daily basis. Um, lastly, I'll just say that, um, that, you know, I covered a lot of details and this can sometimes feel to people like, wow, I'm like learning algebra here or something. Well, it, there is some memorization that's required to identify tracks, but at the root of it, for me, a root, the root of the passion is that there is an aesthetic and artistic appreciation that I get from finding beautiful tracks. I mean, these are these bullfrog tracks. I mean, as much as I didn't want to find a bullfrog in this location, the tracks themselves were just exquisite. And this trail here was one of my favorites. If you If you look here, you just see all this cracked mud everywhere. And then I was looking at it and I suddenly noticed that there's this interesting pattern, a line going down and two off to the side, a line going down and two off to the side, down, two off to the side. And I went up and looked and realized that this is actually the walking trail of great blue heron as it walked on the beach before the mud was cracked. And then as the mud dried, the where the toes were became the, the beginning of all the cracks. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. There's other cool little stories like this turkey vulture trail where it found a fish that had been washed in the mud and grabbed it and walked out. You can see the perfect imprint of a fish and the tracks of the turkey vulture. And then there's just cool species like who would have thought that you could identify northern harrier tracks in the mud? Um, and then there's a striped skunk oh, kind of walking across here next to it. So here's another skunk track down here. Um, and then, um, you know, because it's Austin and because I I'm really into bats. This is the one bat trail I've ever found. It was actually two free tail bats um, in California in the sand, pushing through the sand, leaving a very strange trail. Um, I actually trailed it to the side of the of the bridge and found the two bats there. Um, so I want to recommend some resources. There are a lot of books and and um, sources out there. One of my favorites, I mean, the, the Bible for Mammal Tracks is Mammal Tracks and Sign by Mark Elbrock. It has a second edition with uh, contributions from Casey McFarland, which is super, super good. So I highly recommend that one. Um, he, this is the Bird Tracks and Sign book. There's also this Animal Tracks and Sign of California. I'm a co-author on that one. And this one has all a lot of the information from Mammal Tracks and Sign, but also includes birds and herps and invertebrates. And is actually really relevant for most places in the U.S. It might not have armadillo in it, but pretty much everything else we have here it'll have. Um, I also wrote an iPhone app uh, field guide to animal tracks that's available. There's a free version if you want to explore that. Um, and then Bird Feathers by Dave Scott and Casey McFarland is great. Animal Skulls. So anyway, there's a whole bunch of them. And then lastly, I have a website that's called uh, naturetracking.com. You're welcome to get on there and explore. I have thousands and thousands of photos of animal tracks uh, and a, a whole bunch of free content on there. Um, and then I will also mention that there is an iNaturalist project called the North American Animal Tracks Database. It has almost 50,000 tracks and signs that have been identified in there. And it's really, really neat because you can get in there and, um, and let me actually see I will briefly see if I can change what I'm sharing here. 
I'm going to share my iNational screen. And then at this point, I'm also happy to get to field some questions while I um, bring up the iNational stuff. Good deal. Thanks for that. It, there's a lot of chatter uh, about everyone really likes your idea of learning to tell the story of the tracks from the from the words to the sentence uh, that got a lot of buzz. And I thought that was really cool. Um, folks, if you have additional questions for Jonah, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom. We'll start working through them and we'll get to as many as we can before we run out of time or run out of questions. Um, the first one so, here. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Jeremy, before we jump in, I, I, just as I got this up here, I wanted to point out this is the uh, North American Animal Tracking Database. And one thing that you can do here that's really, really neat is I can go, I can type in black bear and it will pull up all of the black bear observations. And I can change this to the images view and I can scroll through and I can see all kinds of really cool sign, whether it's bears rubbing on posts and stuff or bear tracks or bear scat. And I can do that for pretty much any animal online, you know, for free. It's really, really a cool system. Um, so I could look up ringtail and and we can look at all of the pictures, 101 different pictures of ringtail tracks or road killed ringtail in that case, uh, that people have found. A lot of those are beautiful. Um, so uh, so I really wanna encourage people to explore iNaturalist if you haven't. I, I'm sure that Travis County has been, uh, folks have been mentioning it in their previous presentations, but it is such a cool tool. And I really want to recommend people uh, get on here. And if you want to learn some animal track stuff, this project is really a useful tool. Okay, Jeremy, I'll let you let you shoot off some questions. Sure. So the first one you already answered, they were asking about your favorite field guides. I think you covered that well, and um, they can go back into the recording and, and get that in a bit. Um, the next question, Niles said, he missed a little bit of the intro. Um, why did you get into learning so much about tracking and what's your main work and research that you do? And then he wanted you to go more into feral hogs versus javelina. He said, we have both on our property okay. and um, they both dig and they're destructive, but they can't tell them apart besides catching them on camera. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so first of all, I th thank you for those questions. I um, I don't really know why I got it. I mean, I, you know, it's like asking a musician why they started learning an instrument. I, I just, I, I grew up on a ranch. I played outside a whole lot. Um, and I was always in, in inspired by things I was finding and um, kind of got obsessed with it. I, I have used animal tracks in a variety of different research ways. I've worked on projects, you know, I've worked in Wyoming one winter, uh, driving around snow machines, following lynx trails. So I'd find a lynx track and then I'd get off the snow machine, put on the snowshoes and, you know, follow it uh, for miles sometimes and record uh, different species that it encountered on its trail. So we were kind of uh, learning about lynx behavior. Um, I've, I worked with a bunch of mountain lions um, in captivity where I was making mountain lions walk through sand. And it, you know, if, if you know house cats, trying to make a house cat do anything you want is really difficult. And mountain lions turned out to be the same. So I'd pour sand in their, in their cage and try to get them to walk through. Um, so that I could get footprints of known individuals and it was a total nightmare, but we did it. We did it for 30 something individuals and published a paper in PLOS One on identifying individual mountain lions from their footprints using this kind of complicated computer algorithm system that uh, some folks I was collaborating with had developed. Um, and, and yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. And you could also tell male and female uh, almost like 98% of the time accurately. Um, so it was a really neat, neat tool. Um, but uh, otherwise, you know, one of the odd ways I have found that I use tracking in my job was I, I kind of got this job and I expected, all right, I'm going to be doing all kinds of surveys and using tracking as a research tool a lot. It's turned out to be that that this iNaturalist database is one of the most valuable tools and applications is just people wandering around finding tracks and sharing the location of them. And then I just respond to a lot of emails from our biologists of, you know, photos of tracks that they that they need to know what, you know, is this a mountain lion on this person's ranch or, or, you know, what is going on here and being able to help in that regard. So, um, so you know, a wide variety, it's been a very good, you know, skill to have. It certainly isn't required for somebody in my career to have the skill though. Um, next, javelina versus feral hog. Um, 
one thing I like to say, I mean, I guess let me stop sharing so you can see me full screen here. So javelina tracks, if you make your knuckles like that and stick them in the ground, it makes a pretty good little javelina track. So they tend to be about that long. They tend to be smaller than hog tracks. The other thing is hog tracks, I'm gonna imagine, so here's the hog track, the rounded hog track. Hope you can see me, okay? Rounded hog track. The inside of the cleat, so there's the two cleats or cleaves of the hoof. The inside at the top part is concave on each one. So it kind of curves like that. It's blunt, but it's curved. So if I drew the, if I looked at the inside, it'd be like a little cup. Uh, so it's hard to explain without looking at pictures. Maybe I can find a picture in my um, on iNaturalist. Uh, on, on Havelina, that inner wall, tends to be convex or straight. And so if that's confusing, uh, let me know. And if, um, Jeremy, you wanna cue me up on the next question, I will um, I will try to pull up an image to illustrate what I was just talking about. Sure, the next one actually kind of is in the same vein. It's uh, feral hogs versus goat tracks. Um, so mm -hmm. that one can be kind of Different, and then we've had several people ask about possum tracks. We didn't see it in your um, presentation. Great. Um, so let me just do this. Um, so the good news is that feral hog tracks are really unique. Nothing else has those super wide dew claws. Right, so if you see those wide dew claws, you know it's a feral hog track. It's not a goat, it's not a peccary. It's nothing else. Um, so here's these javelina tracks. Um, actually, um, I'm trying to find some that are clear. Maybe it's gonna be these. Um, so what you'll notice about these tracks, if they'll load, otherwise I'll have to um, go through my own photos. But what you'll notice is that they are, uh, rounded, okay, here we go. They're also upside down, but um, you'll notice that that the inner wall between the two cleaves is sort of rounded or straight. It's not, um, it's not concave, right? It doesn't look like you could fill it. It's not like a cup or something. Um, whereas feral hogs have this, um, have a very different sort of appearance there. Let me just pull up another feral hog track. Oops. Um, I guess this is it, all right. There it is. Yeah, so notice on this one here, how the top is splayed and that inner wall, sorry, my internet is a little slow loading these things, but that inner wall is sort of con convex, or I'm sorry, concave right in here if that makes sense. So hopefully that's helpful. If, if not, you know, I'll have to try to describe some of this stuff uh, uh, in other ways. Okay, so possum tracks, I just didn't cover because of time. Uh, their hind feet are really strange. They look like a little hand like this with a big opposable thumb. And I will again, just kind of pull that up in iNaturalist and the tracking project. So here is, let me just see which ones I want here. So many choices. Okay, so here's some nice ones. We have a, um, the hind foot tends to land really close to the front track. So here's a hind foot here, big giant opposable thumb. Let me kind of make it bigger. And then here's the front track up here, all five toes splayed really, really wide. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, that's great. Um, the next one was from Robin um, about where we'll be, uh, they missed the beginning and where we'll be posting the videos. These will be posted to both our Facebook pages and uh, the city's YouTube page and to the Travis County's uh, video website page. So just check our Facebook and it'll have links to all of those. Um, the next question is, where's your favorite place to go looking for tracks? They said they live next to the preserve, but there isn't any water or mud. So they have tr trouble finding anything other than deer. Yeah, so um, that's a really great point. It turns out that the hill country being central Texas is a challenging place to find good tracks in general. Uh, 
you know, a lot of the rivers you go, you know, go look to it for a river bottom and it's very rocky. Um, and, you know, you, I, I tend to do a lot of mud puddle tracking where, you know, I find, I just kind of wander around and look for little mud puddles everywhere I go. And we call them track traps. If I'm um, going for a walk anywhere and I look over and I see a sandy spot or some kind of dusty spot, I usually go take a look and see what's there. However, it really can help you hugely to go on a few tracking, you know, uh, safari, so to speak, a little tracking tourism, I guess. Uh, Monaghan Sandhills is fantastic for tracking. It's a really cool place to visit if you haven't been to that state park. It's out, um, it's in Monaghan, it's kind of out towards um, uh, Midland, Odessa area, a little west of Midland, Odessa. And it's just these beautiful sand dunes. And when the weather's right, the tracks can just be phenomenal there. Uh, you know, Big Bend National Park is also a wonderful place for tracks. You'll find things like bears and, and uh, mountain lions and all kinds of stuff there. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't hurt to go on a little trip. I, I, actually, I will say, um, if you head east out of Austin and uh, the, the habitat changes pretty quickly, you get into that post oak savanna kind of stuff. Uh, it, under the bridges out there, if you just pull over on the road and go explore under a bridge, you will find all kinds of crazy tracks. I find river otters and bobcats and all kinds of tracks under the bridges out there. Cool. Um, the next up we have, um, in recent years, are you noticing any difference in population sizes and or ranges of the more common mammal species in Central Texas? Um, I am not from my personal experience looking at tracks. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't changes happening, but the changes that I'm aware of, I believe are, um, I guess the, the problem is, is that I cover so little ground as one person that just my personal experience looking at tracks isn't going to give me that data. Um, I will say we have evidence that porcupines have been expanding in their range and that river otters have been expanding in their range. Um, I'm sure some other species are too. We don't have great data on that though. Okay. We have one more question for now and we'll see if any more pop up as we're going. Do you make casts of tracks? And if so, what products or, or how would you typically do that? Yeah, totally. I, um, so Plaster of Paris, you can go buy a big old 50 pound or 20 pound bag of it at a hardware store, or you can buy it in those little boxes for really expensive at a craft store. Uh, you take some Plaster of Paris, put it in a, in a cup with some water and you just get the ratio right. You kind of want it to be a thick milkshakey kind of substance, stir it up in a cup, pour it in a track. Uh, there's a little bit more to get learning how to do it really nicely. Um, if people have, you know, I've built little round barriers that I can put around tracks so I have a nice clean round edge and done some other things like that. Uh, it's a really fun, fun way to preserve tracks. I've, I've made a ton of them. Um, if you really get into it, there's another product called Dent Stone, I believe, that is uh, used by dentists to make molds of teeth, if you ever had your teeth molded. Um, but it has a much stronger, I guess, and has a finer grain, so there's more detail in it. Okay. One last question is, uh, do you ever lead tracking outings? Do you ever lead groups? Um, I do. Uh, the, the only ones I tend to do right now are actually through a group in, um, in Austin called uh, Earth Native. They're, they're, uh, they're east of Austin a little bit. They they teach wilderness survival and stuff. And he, um, and I, so I do uh, tracking certifications actually. It's like a two day certification course. And you either achieve, it's not a course where you come to it and you just get your participation certificate. You actually, it is sort of like a two day test to see what level you're achieving. So you can get a level one, two or three or level four uh, track and, si and track and sign identification. And, um, uh, we encourage beginners to go though because it's a you know it's a test but you learn a ton during it we describe every track in detail and stuff like that um and so the only ones that i've been doing in texas lately have been through through earth native at, at their request but 
I, per I periodically do other ones. Just my, my job is science and research. And so outreach is uh, and working with the public is a um, I'm limited on how much I'm allowed to do. I'm actually only allowed to give 10 presentations a year. And this counts as one of them uh, because I'm supposed to be spending my time doing um, doing you know, focusing on research and conservation stuff. Well, we definitely appreciate your time. There's a ton of great feedback and chat about how everybody enjoyed it and thought it was super informative. And I think you got people awesome. fired up about checking out your resources there. So um, we don't have any other questions. So Johanna, did you have any uh, final closing? Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you. And this has been such a great resource and I'm so glad it's we've got this recorded. Since I think a lot of folks are gonna be going back and referencing the things that you mentioned and showed.